Father, what a privilege we have to have such a history and such a compilation of wonderful music by which we can praise you. And we pray for that day that will come soon. We'll be able to join together in singing once again. We ask you to join our hearts together around the throne of grace and around the word of God this morning. Thank you for each one here. And may the spirit of God be our guide. May he speak to us this morning. Help us become more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, for we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, did you recognize most of those? Yeah, it was a wonderful uh, opportunity, I think, for us to almost get a whole, well, we got a whole bunch of messages there already this morning, just from the messages of the songs, and so we have a great heritage to uh, encourage us in the, in the music of the church. So, Pastor Daniel, uh, what are you doing? Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> We want to welcome you once again to Faith Fellowship Baptist Church. We're glad that you're here this morning, and uh, we're glad that uh, we can actually expand our capacity just a little bit. Uh, that's one of the new things that has come out in the last couple weeks is that faith-based services can go up to 30% of capacity. And so I came in and counted the chairs that are set up in here. There are 249 set up, which means if we set up one more, that makes a really nice number. Uh, but 30% of that is 75 people. And so according to the number of chairs that we have set up, we can go up to 75 people in a service as long as we still stay spaced out like all you guys are, and uh, that's a good thing. So uh, we are still going to do two services. We have more than enough people signed up for our two services that uh, we still need two of them, and that's a wonderful thing. Uh, with 75 in both services, then that means 150 total could come uh, on a Sunday morning, and that's basically what uh, we were getting beforehand anyway. So... Uh, we are excited about that and excited to maybe see more and more of you guys who are watching on the on YouTube right now, see more of you guys join us in person. And uh, we continue to have uh, hand sanitizer set up. We continue to have wipes in the bathroom. You can wipe down surfaces that you touched and stuff and drop it outside. Um, and uh, yeah, we're uh, excited about the expanded capacity and pray that God will continue to uh, guard our province and give our uh, leaders wisdom and uh, that we would be able to continue to meet more and more in person we're excited for that for those of you who are watching online don't forget that there's also ffbc for kids uh, that's our kids series pastor daniel is meeting with the kablooies and teaching them about doctrine and uh, we'll have in service we'll have a little taste of that later on um, and if you want to see the whole thing uh, it's on our youtube channel along with our sunday services going up sometime in the afternoon today uh, we're excited about those things uh, the in-church stuff that's still going on. Uh, Bible study is going to be resuming, the one with Pastor Dan in the Book of Romans. And uh, you can come and join us on Tuesday mornings from 1030 till noon. And uh, that's an exciting thing. So if you are interested, let us know, and we'll make sure there's chairs and material and everything for you. And uh, we'd love to see you here on Tuesday mornings for that little small group Bible study. On Friday morning, we still have our church prayer time. We invite you all to come on Friday mornings at 7.30, and uh, you can join us for prayer as uh, a corporate body. We pray for our church and for our missionaries and everything that's going on. And uh, Then the big one, uh, this week is VBA. We're very excited about it. Robin McIntosh has been our summer intern this year, helping out with uh, getting ready for VBA, and so her and I are working together in a lot of ways, and we have a few other volunteers coming in, and we're really excited for VBA. We have just under 30 kids at this point who are signed up, and uh, we're excited to get to preach the gospel, and excited to play games, and excited to uh, make crafts and memorize verses and all that stuff with the kids who are coming. Uh, there's still room if uh, if you want to sign up for VBA. If you know someone, uh, you have to sign up real quick though, because we would prefer if people sign up before they come, just so that we know how many are going to be here and we can plan for the numbers that are coming that sort of thing. So encourage people, if, if they're still on the fence, sign up online, go to our church website, that's faithfellowshipbrandon.com, and uh, we're excited. Um, if you're not coming to VBA, but you want to be involved in some way, we just ask that you pray for us. Pray every day. If you have a phone, you can set an alarm on your phone for 9.30 every morning and for 2 every afternoon, because that's when we start uh, those two times throughout the day. And then when your alarm goes off, just offer a quick prayer for VBA. That's an awesome way that you could do that, or just pray for us uh, whenever you pray throughout the day. We'd appreciate your prayers that these kids would uh, hear the gospel, that we'd connect with them well, that the uh, week would go smoothly. We'd appreciate prayers for health. 
Uh, we're going to do our best with measures to make sure that kids have hand sanitizer, and we're going to check temperatures in the morning, and we're going to um, play games that don't specifically encourage touching or sharing of d anything. Uh, and so we're going to do our best, but there's always the possibility that something could spread, and we just want you to pray with us that uh, God would protect our camp and our church from all that kind of stuff. So VBA, we're very excited for it, and uh, yeah, we just ask that you would be in prayer with us about that. Uh, at this point, we're going to read our scripture uh, for the day. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10? 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to be reading the whole chapter there. I believe it will be up on the screen as well. Um, yes, why don't you stand with me this morning as we read God's holy word. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to be reading the entire chapter. I, Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away, I beg of you that when I am present I may not have to show boldness and such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be ashamed. I do not want to appear to be frightening you, to be frightening you with my letters, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech of no account. Let such a person understand that what we say by letter when absent we do when present. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, be, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labor of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you, without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord." For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Pastor Dan, would you come preach the word of God to us this morning? We're in 2 Corinthians. We're in chapter 10. We've been working our way through the epistle that's a lot about what the ministry is about, a lot of be about what the minister is to be or the servant of the Lord. And so we've come to chapter 10, and Paul is dealing with issues of spiritual warfare and uh, characteristics of spiritual warriors. So as the passage uh, we've read there, um, I hope you have your Bibles open. Paul is always on the lookout for wolves in sheep's clothing. During his final farewell to the elders at Ephesus, we read that in Acts chapter 20, he says the following. He warns them that wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. The New Living Translation says, watch out. So there's that need that we have to always be vigilant <coughs> because along with the false teachers, of course, our enemy... The Satan is always um, marching about, seeking whom he may, may devour as well. The detractors that Paul faced, uh, the wolves uh, in Corinth, and here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and throughout the letter, 
are the ones who are causing trouble in the congregation. And we've already addressed some of those issues earlier in the epistle. But they seem to be guided by an inverted man-focused and worldly value system. Paul's ministry, therefore, is seen to be weak and seen to be fleshly in nature. Even the gospel message is under attack from these individuals. But in particular, we notice here in this passage, and we see it later on in verse 10, that Paul's individual person, his character, his uh, physical nature is being attacked as well. I understand that there's only one potentially reliable description of the Apostle Paul based on earlier tradition uh, from the great classical scholar and archaeologist Sir William Ramsey. <clears throat> he shares a piece from the first century called the Acts of Paul and Thecus, whoever Thecus is. And in the original Syrian, which of course I read last night, um, it says Paul was described as being a I'm joking, I don't know, I, I can't read Assyrian. A man of middle, Paul was a man of middling size and his hair was scanty. His legs were a little crooked and his knees were projecting or far apart. And he had large eyes, his eyebrows met, and his nose was somewhat long. So you can understand why Paul's character or his, his physical nature would have been an easy target in a sense for someone looking to make the uh, people believe that the Apostle Paul was, um, was uh, a flawed. And certainly his physical character would have meant that he was not the ideal Greco-Roman man. And so it must have created a perfect image for the false teachers when they sought to proliferate that Paul was a weakly, sickly Christian or creature and a little man without boldness or power or presence except when he was writing paper bullets to try to knock them off their place. Their Greek training, the false teachers' Greek training and education would have taught them that power and authority was what they needed and it stood in opposition to meekness, humility, grace, and servanthood. After all, Paul worked with his hands. He was a tent maker. That's a lowly profession. He wasn't skilled as some of them and others perhaps like Apollos in his ability to communicate. His, his rhetoric was not as smooth as theirs. He was considered to be meek and mild, not genuinely humble. Uh, he was poor and people would say, well, where's the blessing in that? Where's God's blessing or evidence of God's blessing? He lacked experience in ecstatic utterances. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote himself, 1 Corinthians 13 and 14, he would rather speak 10 words in a known language than 10,000 in an unknown language. Where's, where's the experiences of the Spirit there? He had a full life of trials, troubles, persecutions, and difficulties, and we're yet to read of some of those in chapter 11. So Paul was an easy target, as I mentioned, to, uh, to, to show the people of Corinth that this is somebody that was living by faith and not by the Spirit, as opposed to us. We have the evidences of God's blessing because we are uh, good speakers and we are well-to-do and we have positions of power and authority. And that was what Paul was trying to address in the city of Corinth. So in chapters 1 through 9, Paul directed his attention to the majority of the church, but in chapters 10 through 13, he's addressing, directly addressing an issue of these false teachers and false prophets. And and so now, <clears throat> the word now in verse 1 is in some of your translations and not. It's implied in the text. Now Paul is beginning a new section. And as one author said, now he goes uh, to war against the rebels. So in verses 1 through 6 of chapter 10, we see some characteristics of spiritual warfare. Characteristics of spiritual warfare. Paul says in verse 1, I, I Paul, myself entreat you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold to you when I'm away. He's confirming, in a sense, one of the accusations against him. But Paul begins to correct their understanding with this little bit of irony. He didn't hide behind some false assumption that everything they were saying about me was wrong. Paul admitted, hey, I'm a humble guy. I, I'm, I'm not presenting myself as the focus of all the ministry. And part of their accusation then was true. It was my day-to-day -day regular behavior. Uh, but his distractors were trying to make that a weakness. But, but Paul beautifully responds to them by using this character of Christ. He says, I'm coming to you as Christ would come to you in meekness and humility. He says the gentleness of Christ, and the idea there is to have a humble and gentle attitude, results in patient endurance. Do we need to have that? Of course, that's a strength. How many of you find patience just a natural response? Yes, I see that hand. I'll talk to you after. Uh, it's hard for us to be patient, to endure difficult situations. Uh, it also refers to being free from anger, hatred, bitterness, having no desire for revenge, to be powerful but under control, 
So Paul says, I came to you in the gentleness of Christ. I also came to you as Christ would come to you with humility. Or the word is kindness. It means that I have every right to expect things from you as an apostle, but I'm, I'm holding off. I don't need to exert my authority. So Paul's argument is a brilliant argument. He's saying that if Christ spoke of himself as meek and gentle or humble, he says, well, where's the weakness in that? I'm being accused of these things that Christ said he himself was. That's not weakness. That's strength. So Paul right off the bat is combating this false accusation against himself. Jesus himself humbled himself to death on a cross. And we're told to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt us in due time. But Paul begins his appeal for correction with irony and he continues with an entreaty in verse 2. He says, I beg of you, don't make me come to you with boldness. The word there means that it's a word to become courageous. In other words, Paul says... I have every ability to come to you and show to you the power of God within me. I can get angry if you want me to get angry at unrighteousness. I can deal uh, forcefully with you if I need to, but don't make me come that way. I don't want to come, as, as he wrote that severe letter earlier, to correct wrongs. He says, I want to come to you. I want to enjoy my time with you. Who, who looks forward to some relative coming and showing up at the door for a tongue lashing? No, none of us. Some friend shows up and says, I have something I need to get off my chest. We look forward to those times, right? No, we don't. So Paul says, when I come, I want to come peacefully. I want to come with meekness. I want to come with humility. Don't make me come and become bold. He says, I, want to, I, want to necessarily, I don't want to necessarily stir up any troubles. You have troubles enough. Let's deal with those before I get there. When Paul was defending the truth, he was a tiger for the truth. When it came to defending his children in the faith, Paul was fearless. And if anyone had mistakenly considered Paul too weak for such active duty or for such battles, then they were terribly mistaken. They have yet, we have yet to read, as I mentioned, his encounters for the gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But the biblical record of Paul's battles for the gospel includes such things as facing hostile mobs, beatings, imprisonments, riots, shipwrecks, plots on his life. He had to face down the Sanhedrin in defense of the gospel. He had to meet face to face with Roman governors. He had to meet with King Agrippa. He was even looking uh, ahead to meeting with the emperor. He had to confront false doctrine at the Jerusalem council. He even did not face uh, uh, back down from facing Peter face to face because Peter was hypocritical in his response to the Gentiles and choosing the Jews over the Gentiles in Galatians chapter 1 and 2. Paul was ready for battle, but he says, I don't want to do battle. Let's deal with these things so that when we come together, we can have peace. He was saying to the believers that it's time for you folks to walk away from the lies and the deceit and the hypocrisy of the false teachers. So that that group of you that is still having difficulties with me and understanding the ministry, understanding my time with you will become less and less and less. So when I come, there's less and less and less of you to deal with forcefully. So Paul's appeal for correction is verses 1 and 2, but then Paul's approach to conflict we see in verses 3 through 6. And this is the aspect of spiritual warfare. Verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Paul begins to draw the lines of serious conflict. Notice the words that are used in verses 3 through 6. And this is something that you and I need to be aware of, that we are involved if we're trying to follow the Lord, be obedient to the Lord, be faithful to the Lord. This is something that you and I are involved in every day of our lives. So Paul uses these terms to get us to understand the significance of what we've been called to as Christians. In verse 3, he's talking about waging war. Verse 4, he's talking about weapons and warfare and strongholds. Verse 5, we're to destroy arguments in every lofty opinion, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Verse 6, being ready to punish every disobedience. The word there for punish is to court-martial things, to place them, to take away their authority, to take away their position. Paul's giving us more insight, as I mentioned, into the gospel ministry that we all have. He began to talk about that in 2 Corinthians 4 and 5, that we we are frail human clay pots. But within us, God has placed the treasure of the light of the glory of God. Isn't that an amazing thing? Think of some of the clay pots that you might have around your house of the insignificant treasures. And sometimes they they hold plants, living living beings. That's that's power. Very insignificant uh, containers in our house can contain some very significant things. Paul says within us, 
is the power of the gospel, the new life that is ours in Christ. The warfare analogy, analogy is something in the Christian life of the Christian life is often used in scripture. So when Paul starts talking about this battle, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us. You might be thinking, I never signed up for this. Well, yes, you did. This is part of what God has called us to. Second Corinthians chapter two, Paul urged Timothy to remember the hardship of the Christian life. He writes, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Soldiers are focused and it's a difficult thing to stay focused over a long period of time. Second, or first Peter, or first Timothy chapter six, verse 12, Paul says, fight the good fight of faith. Second Timothy four, seven, Coming to the end of his own well-lived, battle-scarred life, Paul says, I have fought a good fight. Ephesians chapter 6, Romans chapter 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, believers are encouraged to put on their spiritual armor. So why would God have given us spiritual armor if he did not intend for us to use it, for us to be aware of the fact of why we need it and how to use it in order to stay alive, as it were, spiritually? We're in a battle. We're in a spiritual war. And in our daily battles and our struggles, verses 5 and 6 say, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. In order to win the spiritual battles for truth and to protect the faith of the believer, believers, Paul resorts to his spiritual armory, God's provision so that we're well suited for spiritual victory. Paul reminds us as believers, too, that these weapons that God has given to us have divine power. It's not something that we have to create on our own. We don't have to come up with our own ideas as to how I'm going to win spiritually, how I'm going to be victorious spiritually, how can I overcome the, the thoughts and ideologies and philosophies that are attacking me today. Paul says, here's what we do. Every city has armaments or fortifications, bulwarks, barricades that protect the city. But the way Paul's using it here is that this stronghold, the word is used in reference to the arguments and the assertions that people use as, as foundational and as guards for what they believe. Paul says we're up against ideologies, we're up against philosophies, we're up against beliefs and opinions of people. And he says they are strongholds behind which people stand. But the gospel, in 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says, is power to destroy the wisdom of man. He says, secondly, in these verses, high towers and ramparts are the arguments and lofty opinions Everything that sets itself up or every view or opinion or, or um, reasoning, philosophies, uh, viewpoints that sets themselves up against the knowledge of God is what we're fighting. Is any of that going on today? Well, you know it. The church is under attack. The scripture is under attack. God and his existence are under attack. There's a battle going on and we need to be conscious of the fact that we are involved in this battle. And Paul says there are a lot of things that are lifting themselves up against the pure knowledge of God. John MacArthur makes an important point here. He says this notion that spiritual warfare involves direct confrontation with demons is foreign to scripture. Christians who verbally confront demons waste energy and demonstrate ignorance of the real war. We are not called to convert demons, but sinners. The battle is rather, rather with the false ideologies men and demons propagate so that the world believes them. Now listen to the way he put this because I thought it was so accurate in the way that Paul uses the terms. He said, doomed souls, those who are lost without Christ, are inside their fortresses of ideas, they become, which become their prisons and eventually their tombs unless they are delivered from them by belief in the truth. If a person hangs on to a particular ideology, they stand behind their bulwark. But if they don't ever leave there, it becomes their prison. They can't get out. You find it harder and harder to change your perspective, harder and harder to change your view the longer you stand behind this wall of protection. And eventually, if you never repent and never accept the gospel truth, it will become, as he says, your tomb. D.A. Carson wrote, Paul's language of destruction here is not merely about winning arguments or debates. How wrong it is, it is for us to just go into an argument with someone just so that we can win. Just so that we can sense that we've got a little bit of a, an upper edge on someone. That 
you know, I, I got them there. They couldn't answer my questions or something like that. That's not what the, what the goal is at all. He says, Paul means something here far more. His, his weapons or God's weapons destroy the way people think. Destroy the way people think. Demolish the sinful thought patterns, the mental structures by which they live their lives in rebellion against God. See, the very citadel of sins that have captivated our culture and, and our generation include the sins of Romans 1. They dominate the cultural thought and practice, counter, their counter-truth, counter to the knowledge of God. And yet leading up to all these sins, all these ideologies, all these philosophies of men, all the things, the ideas and the opinions that exalt themselves against the, the gospel, Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16, before you get... Or, yeah, before you get to the list of all the sins that are wrong in verses 18 through 32, Paul says in verse 16, let me remind you of the power of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed, Paul says, of the power of the gospel. Not of his own philosophies, not of his own ideas as to how to win people and be victorious in the Christian life, but of his use of the gospel message. Why? Because the gospel has been designed by God to demonstrate his salvific power, his saving power over men. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to those who believe. Paul says, don't ever forget that all of these philosophies and ideologies, all these bulwarks, all these barricades that are put up by people are, are overcome through the gospel message. Paul, what do you mean? He means that we need to share the gospel message. We don't have to be fancy in our philosophies. We don't have to be fancy in what we share. We just have to be truthful. Tell people that Jesus loves them, that he died for them, that they need, they're sinners and lost. They need to receive Christ. And that, Paul says, breaks down all these walls that have been put up where people are shutting out the truth of God's word. Does it happen overnight? Does it always happen in the first encounter? Of course not. But that's up to God, not up to us. He's asked us to be what? Faithful. He's asked us to be persistent. He's asked us to be ready with, a, with an answer for the hope that lies within us. We need to be prepared as spiritual warriors. We don't go into this battle unprepared or ill-equipped. We have weapons of divine power given to us. So when people come to know the Savior, when people believe in Jesus, their faith is in the simple yet powerful message of the gospel. It's what brings down arguments and high-sounding opinions. It's what destroys the bulwarks against the knowledge of God. So when the bulwarks are destroyed, when the barriers are torn down, the high-sounding arguments are answered and annihilated by the truth of God's word, then those who are prisoners within those philosophies are set free. And then they are able to bring captive all their thoughts to the obedience of Christ. Because the mind really is the battlefield. The mind is the battlefield, not, not our methods and methodologies and so on and we just need to come up with another trick to get people into church. We just need to be able to, to, to somehow, you know, come up with uh, different words. No, Paul is telling us here again, the gospel is what makes the difference. Paul's own testimony was of the power of the gospel and his own salvation story. How he was freed from his own fortress of false beliefs when Jesus Christ met him on the road of Damascus. Because he had been living under a, a system of confidence in the flesh, he says in, in Philippians 3. Paul had grown up in this system that says you can save yourself, you can become the person that you want to be, you can, you can have it all. And like the fellow I met once who said, I have everything that I need up here. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I have? Ooh, that'd be scary. But what I have is what God has given to me, the gospel. The idea, D.A. Carson says, is that Christ does not simply help people to think holy thoughts, but that mental structures, plans, and schemes are taken over and transformed as they come into a new allegiance. Christ transforms our earthly thought patterns and installs new godly paradigms. That's where the battle is won. When we, as Paul said, we accept the truth, when we receive the gospel, we receive Jesus Christ, he says then we need to allow our minds to be what? Transformed. How? By the word of God. By the word of God. Characteristics of spiritual warfare in verses 1 through 6. But now Paul addresses the characteristics of a spiritual warrior. He's addressing again the problem that they have with the false teachers. In verse 7 he says, look what is before your eyes. 
If anyone is confident that he is Christ's, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. There's nothing specific in this letter that tells us what exactly Paul was addressing in terms of the wrong uh, teachings and so on, but it may be a hangover from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Remember in chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, Paul was addressing the church that had a lot of divisions over personalities. Some people would say, well, I'm of Paul. He was the founder of the church. We love the good old days. Uh, No, I like Apollos. He's a good preacher. He's a good teacher. I love his stories and illustrations. He's able to communicate well. No, I follow Peter. He's he's the original follower of Jesus, and he's the spokesman for the church. And, And the really spiritual ones would say, no, we are of Christ. We are the real spiritual ones. There's no doubt about that. And so perhaps some of this was being taught and and, uh, encouraged by the false teachers. But Paul is saying here, if you are confident that you are in Christ, well, so am I. We're on the same page. How did you get saved? By faith. How did I get saved? By faith. It doesn't matter who I follow, what I look like, or how I speak. I'm, I'm the same as you. We're on the same page. We're on the same team. As a matter of fact, if Paul had wanted to promote himself, he could have looked at his team. He could have looked at the people on his side, like Barnabas and Silas and and Titus and Timothy, and and the list goes on of all the people that would have supported Paul. He says if these false teachers are interested in in promoting themselves and their pedigree and and having a great resume, he says, well, I could do the same thing, but I'm not. What I want you to do, Paul says, is look at the facts. Look what's in front of you. And if you're ever tempted to follow someone if you're ever tempted to, to raise and elevate someone else, their teachings above, above scripture even, or, or I follow so-and-so and I listen to so-and-so more than anybody else. And Paul says, just be aware of the facts. Follow, their, follow them and follow their followers. See how their followers are living. Paul says, but I want you to, I want you to look, open your eyes, and, and if you're having trouble with uh, dealing with the facts, well, you need to deal with the facts. Don't just listen to what the false teachers are telling you or ones that promote themselves. Actually look carefully at what they are saying and what they are doing. Check out their stories, their fabrication. See if there's any lies. See if there's hypocrisy in their background. Sooner or later, false teachers will be known either through their own actions or through the actions of those who follow them as to whether they're teaching the truth or not. Paul's asking the believers then just to to check out what they live like, what they teach, and then compare it to my ministry. Compare it to my methods. Compare it to my message. Compare it to my character and see who comes out on top. Paul's not trying to promote himself, but at this particular issue, he almost feels like in the scripture he has to in order to make sure that they are not caught off guard by those who are the wolves. So Paul says, take a look at the obvious things examine the facts get rid of the feelings you know sometimes uh you know my wife will point something out perhaps and uh, and, and she it, she's very factual and i'm and i'm not ready to hear the facts because i feel good i don't know if that's ever happened to anybody before is that is that new to me you, you let your feelings sometimes take over and, and the facts or the the actual data that's before you is irrelevant because of how you feel well paul says Stop feeling good towards these people. Check out the facts. And then Paul says, secondly, in verse 8, I want you to look at the purpose of my ministry. My ministry was to build you up, not tear you down, not to replace the authority of the gospel with something else, not to replace the knowledge of God with something else. My authority came from God. My message came from God. My desire is to build you up as, as members of the body of Christ. Paul wanted to make sure that they were not being destroyed, but so he quoted from Jeremiah chapter 31, which is part of the new covenant, that God says, I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. And, and so one author said, Paul wants the Corinthians to think about it a little bit, to see if they could remember that it was Paul who brought them the gospel. It was Paul who founded the church. It was Paul who had built them up in the faith. And that was his goal and his desire. He says, you won't see that in the false teachers. They're in it for themselves. And then I want you, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, to look at my character. I don't want to make, I don't want to make you frightened, but I want you to make you, to make you real. He, they say, my letters are weighty and strong, but my bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. Not content to mock Paul's physical appearance, they also attacked his inability to speak. He says, you know, I, I, I admit, I'm not like Apollos. 
I'm not as cultured as he is. Uh, even though the people of Lystra considered him godlike in Acts 14, that was a misunderstanding on their part about who he was and who he was representing. Uh, I can identify more and some about uh, Paul's ability to speak, perhaps, because uh, during one of his longer speeches, poor Eutychus fell asleep and fell out of the window. I, I don't think that's happened yet since I've been here. Anybody's fallen asleep? Am I wrong? But uh, some people have a genuine ability to communicate the truth well, better than others. But Paul says, that I'm not into a comparison game. He says, if there are some that can speak better, that's fine. If there are some that can speak worse, that's fine. He says, I just want you to know, he says, that I am a man of integrity, that I've consistently cared for you. I've been compassionate towards you. Check out my character, verses 9 through 11. He's just saying, listen, I want to be honest with you. I want to be upfront with you. I want to be me before you. And that's not what the false apostles are like. Paul says, I wanted to focus in on the gospel of God, the straightforward proclamation of the word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he wrote to them, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, I'm proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you, he said, in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Anybody ever have to get up to speak in front of a group of people? You can identify what Paul is, is talking about here. This is a new group of people, and he was coming to them. He was human. He said, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but... I came to you in the demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men but on the power of God. How much better for us to recognize our own weaknesses and our ability to communicate or lack of ability to communicate uh, to rest in the power of God as opposed to our own ability to persuade. Paul says in verse 11, just, I want to just remind you, he says that what you see is what you get. They may be saying one thing about me, but I've been with you. You know who I am. So who I was and who I am now, I'm consistent. I'm a man of integrity. And that goes a long way in being a warrior for the Lord. Well, in the last couple of verses in chapter 10, we recognize that uh, there's issues here that we have to face even in our own society. There's too many today are in the me generation or the me mode. Uh, The focus is on how many likes we can generate, how many tweet followers we can have on our account. And so Paul indulges in verse 12 in some appropriate satirical irony. He he sort of plays with them a little bit here. And and the New Living Translation says, don't worry. We wouldn't dare say that we are as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. Paul says they're simply comparing themselves, however, with each other, using themselves as the standard of measurement. How ignorant. (laughs) I love the way he put that. Paul is saying to them, well, you're going to look good, of course, if you're comparing yourself with other people that look like you and sound like you and talk like you, right? And or like the Pharisee that came into the temple and he said, oh, Lord, thank you so much that I am not like, well, everyone else. I'm my own person. Of course, I look good in my own eyes. Paul says, I would, I'm not doing that. He says, I'm not willing to do what the others are, are doing, comparing themselves with each other. Paul shows that he is very unlike his accuser. If you use the improper standards, then it's easy to have a lofty self-exaltation of yourself, right? A lofty view of yourself. If you lower the standards low enough, you can look good in any situation. You can make yourself feel good in any situation. You can consider yourself right and righteous in just about anything you think and what you do. Paul says they're able to sing their own praises. Well, I'm not able to do that. Paul says that they're, they have, uh, they, they're, they're saying that they have awesome natural courage. Paul says, I didn't come to you that way. I was fearful. Paul says they're like the Pharisee, and they're, they're arrogant, and they're, they're proud. Paul says, I, I'm not like that at all. But the proper standard that Paul used for a spiritual warrior, for one who will be successful in presenting the gospel and be faithful in the Lord's service, is one who judges themselves by the righteousness of God. And that's Paul's standard in Philippians 3. And you and I want to be victorious in the Christian life. We want to be good spiritual warriors. We need to uh, 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 evaluate ourselves, approach ourselves against the right, or put ourselves against the right standards, the standards of righteousness. Paul says, I also wanted to be recognizing, secondly, that it's God that's going to be the ultimate examiner of my life. 
He said in 1 Corinthians 4, As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or any human authority. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. Paul says, My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord himself will examine and decide. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, we've been through that passage. and Paul says, I need to remember as I fight for the Lord, as I seek to please him, as I seek to pre present the gospel, as I seek to be obedient to the, to, the, to the call that I've been given and to the gospel that I've been given, that one day I will stand before the Lord and be accountable for that to whom I am accountable, the Lord, for all that he has given me. I'm not worried about what other people say about me, especially those who don't like the ministry that I'm, I'm trying to present, especially those who don't like the gospel. I mean, if you've watched some of those YouTubes on TV like we have, there are some awful people out there who are uh, hiding behind philosophies and ideologies that, that give them the, the right and privilege to yell and swear at people and just put everything down that's against them. Paul says, I can't do that because I know one day I'm going to stand before the Lord and I'm going to be accountable for, for the words that come out of my mouth, for the thoughts that are in my head, for the actions that I, I, I do. I've got to live a life of accountability. So Paul again says in, from verse 7, just that same principle, please, believers in Corinth, look directly at what's in front of your eyes. Those you have judged to be right and correct and spiritual, well, be careful because they've only been judging themselves by themselves. And they have a low standard. No wonder they look good. What folly, what foolishness. It's without understanding. See, humble people, godly people, righteous people are keenly aware of how, fall, or, uh, how far short we fall of the perfect standard, which is Jesus Christ. So Paul says, we've got to consider what God has given to us and where God has placed us. Don't compare yourself with other people. He says, I've been given a ministry and I love to see the gospel go all the way to Spain. I wanted the gospel to spread across the Europe. Most of us don't have that ability to be that kind of evangelistic in nature and, and, and so on. But look where God has placed you. Look where God has placed me. What can we do in that sphere of influence to be a pleasing, uh, faithful follower, to be a strong warrior in the spiritual battlefield in which we exist every day? Clearly, Paul was not desirous of building his own kingdom, but of the kingdom of God. And so in verse 17, he says, why? Because I want to be able to boast in the Lord, not in myself. Paul says, when I, when I know and we know and we take a look and see what's inside, there's not a lot to boast of. If, uh, I have a, book in my, a new book in my library, and, and I've been reading a little bit. And one of the things that we fail sometimes to recognize in our own lives is the sinfulness of sin just how far short we do fall uh, from the glory of God, just how far short we do fall from the standards of righteousness. And, and Paul says, I want to be able to boast in the fact that God is changing my thinking. God is changing me. I've, I've allowed the word of God to come into my heart. I've allowed the word of God to, to filter through my mind, and he's transforming me. Paul says, I want to be able to boast not in myself, not in the things that I do, my great ideas, my great plans, my wonderful accomplishments, but I want to be able to boast in the Lord, in what he and he alone can do in my life and in others' lives. It's a reference to Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, where Jeremiah wants the nation of Israel to acknowledge that, uh, what God can do and what God can do alone. And then finally, as a challenge, final challenge, we live with many people who are loud and proud of themselves, who boast of their self-righteousness, of their righteous causes, of their equally unrighteous and evil natures. We live with constant temptation to allow the perversive cultural mindset of me and myself to infiltrate and influence the church, influence our own lives, to press us into their mold and mindset, to affect our understanding and knowledge of God. You know, it's going to be harder and harder as the days go on for us to take a stand on truth and it's going to get more difficult and it's probably going to get more personal for many of us in terms of what's expected we must strive however and fight as Paul says in this passage and battle through those who oppose the gospel those who would seek to take captive our thoughts and our desires to obey and our, take away our love for the truth and our faith in the Savior but if we stand and fight for truth and for justice and the gospel, we will never have to worry about 
being condemned by the Lord, even though the world might condemn us. Verse 18, Paul says, we are to seek his well done, not the world's. Ultimately, what matters is gaining God's approval. Isaac Watts wrote a hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and verse 2 says, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast. Save in the death of Christ my God all the vain things that charm me most. I sacrifice them to his blood. You and I, as Christians, are in a battle. And if you don't know it, you haven't been on your knees enough, or you haven't been in the word enough, or you haven't been aware of what it means to be a Christian enough. And being in the battle means that we need to be aware of how to be victorious as Christian warriors. In this passage, Paul says we've been given tools, we've been given armor that has divine power to enable us to be successful. It's not something esoteric out there that's for somebody else. It's for you and I. Every day we face the temptation to allow the world's ideals and philosophies and values to infiltrate us and change us. But those are things that set themselves up against the knowledge of, of God. So we need to be in the word. We need to be on our knees in prayer. We need to be aware of what God can do in and through us. And be aware that there are wolves out there who seek to not do nothing else except destroy us, to elevate themselves. So may the Lord grant us that wisdom and insight and ability to trust him and to see his hand at work in protecting us and giving us the power to do what he has asked us to do. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for Paul's, your words through Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Help us to be aware of the battles, even the subtle things that come our way from day to day that would tend to draw us away from the knowledge of God. Pray in our own lives that you would help us to be ready to ask for forgiveness, to be ready to confess our sins and ask for forgiveness, and to be ready to seek your favor at all costs. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.